Hi, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Executive Education Singapore Futures uh, webinar on the future of sustainability. Uh, my name is Cheryl Chung and I'm the Program Director of Executive Education Singapore Futures and really delighted to invite in, uh, to host all of you today uh, in our wonderful webinar. Uh, usually, we have a very great diversity of uh, participants coming in from uh, all over the world. So we would uh, love it if you would put your name in the chat, you know, let us know where you're joining us from. So also our panelists have some sense uh, of where you're coming from. I do see some familiar faces, so really would uh, love to hear from you. Um, if you can just let us know uh, where you're joining us from, so we get a little bit of a sense of, of where uh, all of you are coming from. Oh, fantastic. Uh, see people as far as the Netherlands, which is fantastic. Uh, Philippines, Singapore, uh, UAE. Wow, okay. Really, really, really delighted to see all of you uh, and really thankful for, your, um, for you joining us, but also your interest in this topic. It's uh, really great. Uh, as many of you who I, I see are repeat <laughs> uh, participants in our, our programs, you know, we, we do this uh, monthly webinar series uh, to kind of raise awareness on futures thinking and scenario planning as applied to public policy. Uh, but this year, we've been focused very much on the topics, right? So uh, today, of course, uh, talking a little bit about sustainability, uh, you know, and uh, really, really looking forward to having a great discussion. Uh, I'm not going to yabber on too much more, uh, but I would say that, you know, where we, well, we've got about an hour or so, uh, you know, we're very delighted to host, a, a, you know, a distinguished panel, uh, of course, will be moderated uh, by Faras uh, Sanwari, who is our Executive Education Singapore Futures Fellow here at the Lee Kuan Yew School, and of course, a sustainability advocate and uh, expert in her own right, uh, you know, looking forward to her uh, asking our panel many interesting and uh, difficult questions, <laughs> uh, but also, you know, holding space for all of us to uh, also engage with the panel. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, we'll be, let me just introduce the panel briefly before I hand over to uh, Farah. Um, so we're de really delighted to have uh, three distinguished panelists. As always, you know, when we talk about futures issues, we really want to get a wide diversity of views. And we're so happy that, uh, you know, these three panelists have joined us from their own different kind of expertise and then uh, different areas of interest. Uh, so first we have with us uh, Benedict Chia, who is the Director of Strategic Issues at the National Climate Change Secretariat, uh, Prime Minister's Office here in Singapore. Uh, Esther Ahn, who's Sustainability Officer, uh, City Developments Limited, Singapore as well. Uh, and uh, Noor Lastrina Hamid, uh, co-founder of uh, Singapore Youth for Climate Action. You know, so really delighted to, uh, to have and host uh, the three of you. And of course, as I mentioned, our wonderful moderator, uh, Farah. Uh, you know, so wishing you all a fantastic conversation on the future of sustainability. Let's explore you know, the uncertainties and different pathways that this future might take. Uh, we're really interested to hear all of your views and do invite everyone to ask uh, great questions uh, later on. Um, over to you, Farah. Thanks, Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Futures Forward, a webinar series by the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy Executive Education Unit. Uh, I'm Farah, as Cheryl has introduced uh, your moderator for this evening, morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you are. And I'm really honoured and happy to be here today with you and our lovely panellists, whom I will introduce shortly. Um, so as you know, the topic for today is about the future of sustainability. And you know, the word sustainability itself has taken root in our society for the past few years. Uh, it's a topic that really, um, you know, makes me not sleep at night, um, <laughs> knowing that the threat of climate change is imminent and that climate change itself is evident. Um, and it's also affecting not just our environment, but our society and economy. Um, and because of that, we actually, we as a people, uh, question ourselves and the way that we've been living our lives and, um, you know, like, is what we're doing today okay for the future in the long run? Um, what of the system today, uh, be in the way we govern ourselves or how we run our businesses, needs to change uh, for a truly sustainable life on Earth? Right. So in the past few years, we've also seen rapid developments and changes in many aspects of our lives uh, that leans into sustainability. And in many parts of the world, including Singapore, governments are acknowledging the threat of climate change uh, and creating green new deals, green plans, 
to effectively address uh, inequity and promote a sustainable economy. Uh, we are also seeing civic activism, notably youth-led activism by Greta Thunberg. I mean, how dare you, right? Uh, has risen in prominence and it has been a catalyst for the private and public sector to act. So there's really a lot to unpack today. And the future of sustainability is not determined by a single sector of society alone. Uh, we need effective partnership and cooperation between the public, people and private sector in order to achieve a sustainable future. Which brings me to our guest speakers for today. Um, like Cheryl has shared, we have three brilliant individuals who are affecting the future of sustainability. Uh, we have Mr. Benedict Chia, Director for Strategic Issues under the National Climate Change Secretariat in the Prime Minister's Office of Singapore. We have uh, Esther An, Chief Sustainability Officer of City Developments Limited, and Ms. Nur, Ms. Nur Lastrina Hamid, Co-Founder of the Singapore Youth for Climate Action. So our very own Greta Thunberg, I suppose. <laughs> Um, so what's going to happen today is that each speaker will get a turn, each get a turn to speak, and right before they speak, I shall give a full introduction of that speaker, uh, so that it will be fresh uh, on your minds. And our speaker will be sharing um, for approximately 10, 10 minutes. Um, I mean, I'll let this flow because, you know, this is also uh, a very friendly, welcoming <laughs> space for people to share as much as they want to. Um, and they will be sharing on the future of sustainability from their perspective, uh, wearing their individual hats from the people, private and public sector. So following that, we will enter a Q&A session where, you, where your questions, uh, which you can start posting anyway right now, um, you know, as we start the seminar, uh, webinar, um, you know, we will answer that question right after they speak, right? Okay, so yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Benedict Chia. Um, give me a second. Mr. Benedict Chia is um, the director for Sorry, again, let me repeat that. Uh, is Director for Strategy Issue, National Climate Change Secretary at Prime Minister's Office. Uh, he is a responsible for economic research and development of low carbon technologies and futures work. And prior to that, he has served in the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Trade and Industry, as well as Ministry of Environment and Water Resources, newer. Um, and because he's also in the strategic issues, he's very familiar with futures work. This is a very exciting thing to do because I, uh, as a fellow, futures fellow here, uh, there'll be some words um, that's very interesting in, in the future space, like, you know, wild, wild cards or um, weak signals. Uh, driving forces, things like that. It'll be quite interesting to hear from Benedict's perspective. Um, without further ado, ben Mr. Benedict Chia, could you please uh, share with us your perspective on the future of sustainability? Uh, well, thanks so much, Farah, for the very, very kind introduction. Um, so I'm, I'm Benedict. I'm from the National Climate Change Secretariat. Uh, we were set up as an outfit uh, within the Prime Minister's office in 2010. Uh, so 2010 was really just after the collapse of the Copenhagen climate talks. Uh, but at that point in time, we felt that climate change uh, was an important issue that, that is quite likely to be with us for a while. And, and that, that was one of the reasons why uh, the Secretariat was being formed. And our role within the Secretariat is to really work with the various stakeholders, both within and outside government uh, in Singapore, to advance, to shape, and to set a direction for our climate policies itself. Um, on the issue of the future of sustainability, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about four very broad trends uh, uh, which we have seen happening uh, and, and hopefully that lays the um, groundwork and, 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 and that helps bring in the, the, the other, uh, uh, my, 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 my other panelists on, on the panel itself. Um, and the, the, the first I will start with is, is really about climate ambition. <clears throat> and, and on that, one of the big things that has really um, uh, happened over the last couple of years uh, is this shift towards uh, net zero by 2050. Um, uh, if you look at um, Glasgow uh, decisions last year, at the end of COP last year, uh, there was a shift in anchor. There was a shift in anchor towards 1.5 degrees, the world trying to keep and trying to work towards 1.5 degrees. And I say that's a major and a significant shift because if I just rewind back a couple of years to, to 2015 and, 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 and I use the Paris Agreement as a reference, the Paris Agreement actually anchors two degrees instead of 1.5 degrees. And, and, and you may ask, what's the difference between two degrees and 1.5 degrees? And, and, and the main difference is that uh, in a two degree world, uh, you, the world collectively only needs to reach net zero uh, by around 2070. 
But if you want to keep temperature increase to, to, to within 1.5 degrees, then it's not 2070, but it's 2050. And I, I, I think if you look at the number of countries, if you look at the number of corporates that have made net zero by 2050 pledges, you will realize that a significant number of them has been a huge increase at least over the last couple of years. Uh, we, we, uh, we track them and, 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 and we see this huge spike itself. Um, Aligned with what has been agreed at Glasgow last year, uh, this year in our budget statement, uh, we have actually, our, our finance minister actually stated and announced that Singapore uh, is going to work towards net zero by around mid-century. And we're currently in the process of uh, uh, consultations and engagements uh, before later part of this year, we hope to announce a very specific net zero year itself. Um, so, so, so that's the, the, the first big trend that, that we see, uh, this shift towards uh, net zero by 2050. The, the, the second trend or, um, in terms of where we see the future of sustainability is um, really a lot more collaboration across countries. Um, um, if you look at some of the key uh, technology solutions out there, like hydrogen, uh, for, for, for example, many more countries are coming together to talk about it, to talk about establishing global supply chains, talk about um, uh, uh, global certification standards and whatnot, to give assurance on where's the origin of hydrogen, for example. Uh, the, the other area where we see significant collaboration is what has been agreed last year at COP, which is, uh, it, it, it's the technical term is Article 6, but Article 6 is really a framework for cooperative approaches. It's a framework where countries can come together to cooperate on reducing emissions. And the outcome of that cooperation in terms of um, uh, abatement and um, uh, mitigation outcomes can be traded internationally as carbon credits. And, and, and that is a significant milestone because we have tried a number of years to secure Article 6, but we were not successful in securing Article 6. Um, uh, last year um, uh, was a fairly monumental effort. Singapore was approached to, to help in the effort and our Minister for Sustainability and Environment, Grace Fu, uh, agreed to drive and, and to co-facilitate at the ministerial level. And, and, and I, I think we are, we are quite happy that we, we've managed uh, to, to play a part in, in, in bringing the global community to agree on uh, Article 6 itself. So, so that's, that's, that's really the, the second trend. Uh, countries coming together uh, cooperating on developing decarbonization solutions. Um, the third trend I wanted to talk a little bit about is that uh, actually if you if you look over time, many of these um, solutions to reduce emissions have actually fallen in cost significantly. Solar is one example that people have talked about. Uh, if you look at the trends right now, electric vehicle prices are also falling. Uh, the hope is that hydrogen may also follow the same trend. Uh, and, 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 and the implication of this is that going green embracing net zero um, is increasingly being seen as uh, a trade-off. If I do this, it comes at higher cost to the economy. Uh, there is sacrifices that need to be made. There, 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 there is still higher cost. I'm not saying that there's no higher cost. Uh, there, there is still transition cost in terms of um, uh, uh, some of the current incumbents needing to make the shift, needing to make the adjustments. But it's increasingly being seen as a virtuous cycle. In, in, instead of a trade-off itself. And, and many companies that we have spoken to have actually pointed out the fact that it's becoming increasingly necessary to be able to, uh, to uh, make the shift, to make the transition if they are, uh, were to try and to succeed in a low carbon future itself. Um, finally, the, the last um, trend that I wanted to raise is um, going forward, I, I think we see a more multi-stakeholder environment where it's not just the government uh, driving action, being seen as the one that is responsible for um, um, uh, um, uh, doing all the hard work in, in order to, to, to achieve the reductions itself. But I think we see corporates, we see cities, we see the people sector coming in in a very much bigger way. Uh, corporates setting very ambitious targets, cities which are below the federal government in most other countries have also taken the lead and jumped ahead with very ambitious goals. And consumers increasingly are... are, are are voting in terms of how, how they um, uh, make their purchase decisions, um, um, uh, look, 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 looking at green and more sustainable products in a more favorable light com com compared to how they uh, did so in the past. Uh. Um, so I, I, I think going forward, um, uh, it's, it's a difficult journey towards net zero, uh, but I think it's one in which uh, there are more partners along the way, and, and we look forward to working very closely with various stakeholders, both within and outside Singapore, in order to realize our vision. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Benedict. Um, yeah, uh, that was a great sharing about the four key trends um, by Mr. Benedict Chia about, you know, what the future of sustainability could hold and you know the important things that we could take note of is about climate ambition um, there's definitely much more ambition uh, collaboration across countries and the cost of uh, renewable energy falling um, and having multi-stakeholder engagement um, for, and cooperation so these are like four key points and four key takeaways i do have some questions but i think that would be for later um, what we do have our next speaker um, to share with us uh, from the private sector's perspective, we have uh, Ms. Esther An, uh, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of um, uh, CDL, uh, City Development Limited. Uh, so Ms. Esther An has been an advocate for green building and sustainability for over two decades, and she's been instrumental in establishing CDL's global leadership in sustainability since 1995. Um, it's really amazing. Uh, ranked the top real estate company in 2021 and 2022, global 100 most sustainable corporations in the world. CDL was the first Singapore company to publish a dedicated sustainability report in 2008, when it was not really trendy, uh, and issued a green bond in 2017. It became the first real estate company in Southeast Asia to pledge the World Green, World Green Building Net Zero Carbon Building Commitment in February 2021. Um, Mrs. Esther An also conferred, was also conferred the 2018 SDG Pioneer for Green Infrastructure and a Low Carbon Economy by the UN Global Compact for her advocacy in, uh, of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, and UNGC Caring for Climate Network Signatory. Uh, she sits on the boards or of advisory and advisory platforms of leading organizations, including World Green Building Council, Global Reporting Initiative, UN, UNPRI Real Estate Advisory Committee, UNESCAP, um, Sustainable Business Network Executive Council, Urban Land Institute Sustainability Product Council, GRSB Foundation, Asia Pacific Real Estate Association, Singapore Institute of Directors, ESG Committee. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna uh, give the time to Ms. Esther Ann, who is going to share about her perspective of the future of sustainability. Please. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you for having me and a very long introduction <laughs> and a very kind introduction. I think I would just carry on from uh, what Ben has shared. And uh, I would think that everyone would probably agree that the last over the last two years, um, sustainability or ESG, environment, social and governance, really exploded to, into the mainstream. And everybody, you know, is talking about sustainability, whether it is on the global level, regional level, national level, or industry, you know, business level. And uh, I think when I first started the journey 20 over years ago, of course, people think that green building is uh, unnecessary. And uh, people call me crazy when I introduce my first, you know, uh, recyclable shopping bag and all. But now if you fast track to like, okay, 2015 was really, you can see some changes because of um, Paris Agreement. And uh, I mean, I have the honors to uh, actually uh, also, you know, attend uh, COP25 at Madrid. And I don't, I didn't see that type of, you know, uh, dynamism and then the pace there. And, uh, but last year at Glasgow, I really can feel that, hey, there is an urgency there. And everywhere you turn, you can see race to zero as what Ben just mentioned. And I think the sense of climate emergency is really there. And uh, it's, I think it is also because of COVID, the world has actually learned that, hey, our you know, health of our planet, people, business, and economy is all interdependent and all interconnected. Without a healthy planet, there's no you know, you know, people or market for business to thrive and no prosperity are we talking about. So I think the, the climax emergency and the will to actually to achieve a net zero world become a common language and become a common, you know, force that, you know, bring people together. Hey, we all need to really do something to save the planet. If not, we will all not survive. Yeah, so I think that is actually we uh, at the building sector, at the World Green Building Council, we call it a North Star goal. So that is what drives us together. And uh, of course, as a building, you know, in the building sector, CDL has been around for almost 60 years now. And what we are proud of is not, you know, that we, we grew from, you know, we have grown from a, a, a small company with eight employees to today, we are operating in 29 countries and regions. And uh, we are 
in the position to drive change because we are not just building home, just not building you know, commercial property, landlord or hotel management. We are building spaces. And we all know that building and construction sector actually has very high carbon and social impact, accounting for almost close to 40% of greenhouse gas emission globally. But I always say that we don't need to be in the real estate, stack, uh, estate sector to make an impact because all of us, you live in home, you work in the office, right? You, you also, you know, use buildings, whether at work, at home, or even in hotels or, you know, f &B. And uh, people spend about 90% indoor. So how you use buildings will make a huge difference. So that's why I think it is uh, all about the word collaboration and also about caring, you know, for outside our, you know, our little uh, framework of like just home, office, work and all. So you need to think bigger. When you use buildings, you also have to think hard that whether, you know, although I don't pay the bill, you know, should we leave every, you know, light on, even you step out of the office and leave your computer on and all that. And then even when you go to hotel, you blast, you know, a, a con very high, a, a very low, and then, you know, water, you just consume it, you know, at will. So I think the caring and consideration part is very important. It's all about people. And of course, at, the, at Glasgow, we also have seen, you know, um, a lot of so-called zero around. And apart from the race to zero that account for 90% of GDP now, because uh, you have like thousand over cities and, reg and regions and also uh, almost 8,000 companies, you know, educators, financial and healthcare organization joining the race to zero. We also see the financial sectors pushing it, driving it very, very fast. Okay. Uh, in um, 2019, we saw the formation of Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. They are the one who control the biggest, you know, investment in the world. And uh, in uh, 2021, last uh, July, last year, July, we saw the uh, Net Zero Insurance Alliance formed. And in November at Glasgow, um, Net Zero Banking Alliance was set up and also the, the very important uh, alliance is actually the Glasgow Financial uh, Alliance for Net Zero. And what it comprises, uh, actually comprises all the leading stick, uh, stock exchanges and, uh, you know, banks, investors and service providers and innovators and, and, and enterprises. So all these, you know, come together and you can see that what the common goal is about net zero. So I think I'm also very optimistic that now that we can really see change and you can see the people who control the finance are really driving it. And I, as a, you know, private sector, what we are looking at is also, you know, in the past, always people see is, cost green building is cost but if we look at it carefully today the business case of you know embracing sustainability is much stronger if you look at the the green plan and just now ben talk about singapore also you know really pledged for like you know achieving net zero by or around 2050 and then what came with it in february that we all heard about carbon tax Today, we are talking about $5 per ton. And in two years' time, less than two years, actually, it will be five times more, it's $25. And in another two years, it will be $45. And by 2030, it will be as high as you know, $80. So that will also increase the you know, business costs and even grid price, you know, whether individual or even, you know, um, uh, of course, businesses will, will, be, you know, um, will be looking at it very carefully. And when we you are familiar with the green plan. You can, you know, the, the biggest one actually is energy reset. We all talking about net zero is about, you know, largely contributed by energy. So for us uh, in the building sector, uh, the green building master plan is to green 80% of all buildings in Singapore. And now we are about 45%. So in the next seven or eight years, we have to green another almost, you know, 35% more. So how are we going to do to tackle all these and, you know, and, and meet all these so-called climate ambition, like what Ben say. So we are not talking about risk mitigation anymore. We are talking about risk adaptation.
So which bring me to, you know, to the four strategy, uh, strategic pillars of our, you know, as a business uh, sec- uh, 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 private sector, we have actually our ESG strategy. And then the four pillars are actually the four I we're talking about. Integration is very important. We can't, you know, just practice sustainability alone. You need to, feel, you know, embrace it into your overall business strategy from your board to the top management, mid management, operation staff, from the headquarter to the subsidiary. Everybody must be integrated and also your value chain because you can't do it alone, right? We are the bigger uh, procurer, but we need to get the SMD on board. And, you know, and then so we actually have the, the second eye is actually innovation. Without innovation technology, you will not move the needle. It will not certainly become net zero. Nothing will, will, will change if you don't adapt, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to changes and, uh, you know, embrace innovation and technology. And all these don't come free. So investment is the third eye that we're talking about. So how do we find fundings to invest? And uh, today, of course, we are looking at real ROI, you know, even like improve energy efficiency that will help us save a lot of, you know, um, uh, utility, you know, expenditure and all that. And of course, you need to really invest in technology. And last but not least is impact. Everything we do has an impact. So um, behind me, you can see the SDG and we can't do it alone. And uh, we also have to measure, you know, what is our impact and also identify gaps and improve it so that we can look at, you know, the target of net zero. Where are we now every year, year on year, and you, you improve. Last but not least is the partnership. We can't do it alone as private sector. We work with the whole value chain, the whole ecosystem, from regulator, policymaker, and of course, financier, you know, um, and, and contractor like for us and a, a supplier. And of course, people. We work with everyone actually, uh, including youth and all that, which I will, you know, which I will share a little bit more. If I may just give a, one example, which is the Singapore Sustainability Academy, which actually we thanks to NCCS and it was actually opened by you know um, senior minister to Chihen at, uh, in 2017 uh, and you know in his capacity as uh, NCCS and also you know uh, driving uh, climate um, uh, action in Singapore and uh, it was actually open with a partnership uh, support of six government agency and 15 industry partner and NGO partner for all, for the past five years we have actually engaged and uh, reached out to tens of thousands of people 630 events and uh, over the past five years and uh, not only reaching out to Singapore but also reaching out you know through digital platform and of course we have worked with uh, uh, the trainer the seeker for some years already. So I can talk a little bit more on our youth program that uh, I can go in forever. So I think I better stop here first. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Ms. Esther. And uh, wow, that was a wonderful sharing. Uh, hearing from you is, is really quite inspiring, uh, knowing that you know the private sector is actually in, in a position to actually create a lot of change and that CDL itself has been at the forefront of this, um, you know, starting very early um, when it wasn't even like the most trendy thing to do. Um, really um, inspiring. So we have our last speaker, Ms. Nur Lastrina Hamid, uh, who is the f- co-founder of um, co-founder of Singapore Youth for Climate Action. Uh, so having organized organ- uh, community events and working with youths and volunteer groups for the past 10 years, uh, Ms. Nur Lastrina Hamid has built an interest in climate issues and how people respond to climate impacts. Uh, In 2015, uh, Lastrina co-founded SYCA, Singapore Youth for Climate Action, to engage youth in climate action or environment-related volunteerism, and her list of futures-related engagement previously included um, being on the panel uh, for IPS, Institute of Policy Studies, Annual Flagship flagship Conference, Singapore Perspective, on new forms and movement, uh, in the new forms and movement. No, in the second panel, uh, New Forms and Movement. Uh, She was also a panel speaker at the IPS Reimagining Singapore Forum on Sustainability and Livability. Uh, She was also a participant in the IPS Reimagining Singapore Workshop on Non-Traditional Threats to Human Security. Uh, So I give the time to uh, Lastrina to share with us more about her perspective on the the future of sustainability. Go ahead, Lastrina. 
Thank you, Farah. Um, and thank you to the LKY SPP team uh, for the invite for me to be alongside the panel together here with Benedict and Esther as well. Um, so, you know, with Benedict setting the scene by sharing the four trends and Esther earlier on from the private sector perspective, including CDL's four strategic pillar, um, I think it's very clear for everyone, right? I'm coming in from the people's perspective um, and maybe just to guide um, along for myself as well. Um, in terms of this introductory remark, I'd like to give my response uh, following the event blurb um, that was written on the website uh, so that everyone also can follow along. So I'm just touching on three points, uh, observations from the past decade uh, and some lessons learned uh, where we have succeeded or where I think you know, we have succeeded from the people sector uh, and consider what this means moving forward for the people sector. So for the first uh, point, as what Farah has mentioned earlier, I am someone who has been actively volunteering in the environment sector in Singapore. So from my perspective, I've seen you know, the giants of Nature Society Singapore um, from the late 90s, and I know they've been around prior to that, uh, you know, the giants of Singapore Environment Council, and subsequently the growth of ground up initiatives such as Singapore Youth for Climate Action, Climate Conversations, um, SG Climate Rally, um, Accommodate SG, uh, as well as individuals who are active on social media. I think um, if participants here are interested, you can check out Instagram accounts of Earth to Dorcas, uh, Weird and Wild, uh, BYO Bottle SG as well. So I'm just looking at all these growth the past five years and just want to make a point that from my personal observation, there is a growing movement of people who are talking about climate change and sustainability related issues, uh, which brings me to the second point uh, in terms of where I think we have succeeded. Um, so I think we have succeeded in various uh, ways. Uh, the one which I think is very apparent is increasing the discourse around climate change on social media. So I mentioned Instagram earlier. Um, I'd also like to highlight TikTok as another um, very interesting platform to check out, you know, all these climate change discussions. Um, and I also like to highlight the youth statement that a group of youths um, and environmental organizations brought up towards end of last year as a lead to the COP26 Youth Day program. Uh, so in Singapore, we actually had a group of youths coming up with a public statement um, that was released uh, in November talking about, you know, their demands or their uh, goals for what they think climate action can be in Singapore. So that's one example. Another example uh, in terms of, I think, where we have succeeded is how young people have contributed to change in company practices. So this one has been um, quite a while. Not sure if people can remember, but in Singapore uh, in 2017, we had uh, two teenage um, environmentalists. Um, they were in school at that time. I'm so sorry for the jet sound. Not sure if you can hear that. Um, so yeah, so we had this uh, two environmentalists uh, who started off a petition asking for Old Chang Ki and Polar Puffs also, I believe, to use sustainable uh, palm oil. So I think it started off with good intention and then also Old Chang Ki had a response, you know, they're already using healthier oil, but now they're looking into uh, RSPO oil. Um, and sus subsequently, there were changes made. So I think, you know, that's just one example of how I think we have succeeded in changing companies' uh, practices. Uh, another one is in terms of how we have succeeded in contributing to change at the national policies level. So this one, uh, maybe for those in Singapore, you may be aware last year and this year, we had PAP MPs filing the motion on climate change. Um, so as part of that process, um, they also had like focus group discussions with young people, with green groups, and that was an avenue for us uh, to create change at the national level. So just all these examples, just to give you some highlights of where things have, I believe, have gone right and have succeeded in Singapore's context. Um, and this brings me to my third point, right? So now that we have seen the growth um, and some successes, what does this mean uh, moving forward? Uh, so for me, I see two things going on here. So one is in terms of the growing social movement, uh, and the other one is in terms of the evolving nature of partnerships with the people sector and outside of that as well. So on the first part, on the growing social movement, um, so I'm just 
maybe inviting you to also uh, imagine what's been happening globally, um, not just in Singapore, right? So globally, I think we may all be familiar with all these like climate rallies, uh, maybe even civil disobediences in other countries when it comes to uh, calling the government to do more, to do even more uh, to tackle climate change in their respective countries. Um, and then in Singapore, like I mentioned earlier, we have seen a growth of people interested in climate issues uh, the past five years maybe. So I'm just looking at it from that context um, and I'm just also trying to put this into a framework. So not sure if people here are familiar with the works of Bill Moyer. Um, so in uh, he's a US activist educator. Um, he has done quite a, a few um, research and works for activists. Um, and in one of his works, he talks about the stages of social movement. Um, so I think when I was trying to look at that map and trying to plot, plot out, okay, where are we in Singapore in that map? Um, and it feels like we're in stage four where the social movement is just taking off. So the social cause, uh, causes, uh, including climate change is being talked about even with higher visibility. Um, people are starting to take a bit more, I would say, uh, a bit more vocal on these issues. Um, and it's just growing. Um, and, you know, things can happen after this, right? Maybe, you know, there's more anger or maybe people will fall into despair later on. Uh, but we're at that stage where it's just taking off. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and the other part that I talked about was the evolving nature of partnerships with the people's uh, sector. So I think like what um, Esther mentioned earlier, like all those examples that's happening at the UN level uh, and the UN working collaboratively with government, private sector and whatnot, that is also definitely working in the Singapore context. Um, so for those in Singapore, maybe you might be aware uh, the past two, three years or so, um, the Ministry of Sustainability and Environment has had citizens work group. I think the first one was on recycling, right? Subsequently, it was on reducing excessive consumption of disposables. So there's start there's uh, sort of um, a launch, you know, of actively or consciously working with regular citizens to enact change at the national level. Uh, and just wanted to highlight that maybe it's something new for us in Singapore and maybe using this we can try to explore a bit more other types of strategic uh, collaboration between government, people and private sector. So in conclusion from the people's perspective right um, I was just uh, remembering what Esther mentioned earlier about uh, what we are in a position to drive change um, what she said earlier, um, and I think just like to reframe that for everyone here uh, in the audience as well to ask ourselves like when we are seeking change, what change are we talking about? Is it a change of uh, power, a mindset, or policy? Uh, and then based on that, try to find ways where we can contribute to those changes. Yeah, thank you, Farah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasrina. Um, yeah, really resonate with what Nasrina has mentioned just now. Uh, the power of a united, a united voice by the people, really. Um, you know, having that youth published white paper or letter to the government uh, that was mentioned by, uh, that was addressed by Minister Grace Fu immediately right when it was published. Uh, I remember being part of it because I wrote part of it as well. Um, and that when people actually band together to petition against the use of, um, you know, non um, non sustainable oil palm oil um, that like affected the decisions of these uh, private sector com like companies um, but also it's very interesting how there is like a growing social movement um, you know really pushing for change um, because it's really evident out there uh, that there's an issue and needs to we need to do better um, but also the evolving nature of partnerships. And I think on, in the Singapore context as well, uh, it's a very unique case where, you know, we have our members of parliament, we have people in the uh, public sector, like people like uh, Benedict himself, that would part, would bring in the voice of uh, civil, civil society. Uh, so these, these are really, really exciting things for me personally, but also I hope it is for you. Um, so right now we are concluding the segment where we have uh, spoken um, you know each speaker has spoken we are going into the Q&A segment but before we go about that um, perhaps if there are any questions from the panelists themselves or you want to respond to any of the things that have been mentioned by any of the speakers um, yeah feel free to share or was it already mentioned in your 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 part just now perhaps 
Yeah, I, I think maybe a common thread that I uh, hear from everyone is this idea of multi-stakeholder collaboration that we need even more. Mm. Um, so I think just taking that, it's quite broad, right? Just trying to also filter it down to actionable items that we can do. Um, yeah, maybe just throwing it out to the government uh, and private sector uh, representatives or perspectives on what other things you think should happen in order for us to enact change uh, and you know push push from two degrees to like 1.5 degrees. Mm. If I may chime in, actually, just now we are all talking about solar energy here. Actually, I'm on the NUS campus here, and we are just lamenting that you know uh, it's so difficult to get our you know. Um, home buyers to really invest in green building or green home and uh, even solar panels and all that because um, the appreciation of green feature is it's only, you know, just started only the, the last couple of years. And, you know, for anything like Green Mark Platinum level or whatever, it cannot help you help us to, you know, um, uh, uh, set a, a price that reflect that investment. So I think moving forward, I totally agree that consumers, you know, will, is going to be a big driving force. Why? Because, you know, they are the younger generations that will appreciate, you know, um, greener product um, practices and, you uh, you know, and a greener lifestyle also, and uh, which is actually been pushing uh, under the green plan as well, sustainable living, a city in nature, you know, green economy, there are plenty of green jobs and all. So I think definitely all this is coming really fast. So how can we catch the wave and really help to engage, you know, greater force for positive change? And uh, I think consumer will be the ones to push it because when there's demand, that is actually, you know, supply. And, in a, you know, for many years, it's very hard that, that, you know, private sectors are really feeling is that, oh, this is caused to go green. And we have heard it, uh, you know, for many years. But if consumers are asking for it, there is, a market, there is definitely a, a stronger business case. And, uh, you know, I think the younger generation is going, not going to keep quiet and they're going to, you know, drive that change. And I think, you know, um, Working with you know uh, young people like Sika, we've been doing it, and but I think we need to be uh, you know really see action, not just talking, okay? And we really need to have consistent you know clearer idea of what exactly do you want us to do, you know? And I think the young people will be able to implement it. It's like before. Uh, uh, before Glasgow, we sit down with you know a couple of seekers, you know, member Cheryl and 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 and, and Eswati, That hey, let you are going to to uh, Glasgow. I'm also going. Shall we do you know collaborate and have a campaign, you know, to really create you know um, address the rising uh, problem of you know uh, eco anxiety among young people. There are a lot of research and data showing it. The, the group age group that are being affected become very. Um, uh, uh, depressed or you know disappointed or you know uh, feeling a bit helpless of the future it's the age group between 17 and 25 years old so how can we help them I mean no point for everybody just sit down and then I feel depressed I'm not doing anything so what we want to do is like hey let's you know bring out the positivity of everyone yes we are in trouble but not to the extent of just sit here, do nothing. We need to turn this anxiety into action, mm -hmm. turn, you know, negativity to positivity. So that's why we launched this, like, you know, um, a, a, a love our a, a planet, you know, keep calm and love our planet campaign. Basically, is like gather the young people to 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 talk about it in your country. What is your problem, you know, issue, and what have you done, you know, to help? So we exchange notes and all that with all the young people, and we came back to Singapore. We continue the conversation. You know, consistency is important. It's not like a one-off campaign. You can change the whole, change the mindset. It's we have been doing it for twenty-seven years now. So I'm sure that we can still continue to push the, the agenda and uh, among not just the industry or private sector, but in the, in the people sector as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Benedict, would you like to chime in or yeah, answer I, the question I, that is already? I, I just there? wanted to maybe chime in to what um, Esther and, um, uh, and uh, uh, as Esther and Estrina actually talked about it. I wanted to build on this point about translating potential ideas to actually action itself. And I, I think we see this as happening in, 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 in three key stages. Uh, the, the first is actually awareness. And awareness really 
understanding uh, how much energy you're using, how much emissions you're giving out, what are your processes, what are your um, uh, components that are contributing most to this. Uh, and and, and I, I think critically is that awareness part that is quite important. And, and not everybody has a good sense of, of where, where they're emitting, which areas they're emitting. And then after that, I'd say it's appreciating and understanding the opportunities. Uh, what you can do to take action, where which are the areas where you take action, actually it will make significant differences itself. I mean, in, in some instances, symbolic action is important, but actually we, we, we want and, and we want to support uh, uh, substantial action, which, yeah. which, which, which actually results in real outcomes itself. And then the last stage is about implementing the solutions itself. And, 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 and I, I think this is quite wide ranging. It's about, uh, in, in some instances, the organization having the capacity to, to be able to, to uh, execute. It's about uh, government providing the necessary support, uh, our incentive schemes and whatnot. But in, also in, in, in many instances, it's also about um, um, uh, uh, being able to access financing itself. Uh, I, 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 are they able to get the, um, a broader support? Are, are, are banks willing to lend, loan some of the, um, uh, these organizations' funds to actually implement some of these solutions itself? Because many of these sustainability solutions, they, they tend to have a higher cost up front, though over the lifespan itself, you, you can more or less recover it. Uh, but it requires somebody that is that is willing to take a longer term view uh, instead of looking at very near term matrices in terms of how soon can I get my payback and whatnot. Uh. Yeah, so I, I, I thought that's quite important in terms of, 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 of uh, because the, 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 the point I think which, which, which Lestrina talked about is that how, how do we get from two degrees to 1.5 degrees, actually there are opportunities out there and what you need to do to, to explore these opportunities and, and to be able to translate that to uh, action on the ground itself. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, clearly, we all have to take a long-term view of this because the you know we're, we're all in the future space and we all have to like embrace this uh, future's mindset, future's thinking. Um, but yeah, so we have a wave of questions. Um, the first question from Vampalo Valenzuela. Um, Benedict, you wanted to answer this question. Uh, the question is, the Paris Agreement states in Article 2 that we should pursue a 1.5 degrees limit. In 2015, there were not much studies supporting it, but negotiators uh, inserted this into the text invoking the precautionary principle. Now with the release of the report, uh, on 1.5 at 6 AR, um, we have evidence needed to push for 1.5 limit. Okay, I've seen this report, it's quite scary. However, this entails a huge investment within this decade. In your opinion, is mitigation below 1.5 even possible at this point, or should we prepare for eventual adaptation? So it yeah. sounds like there are multiple scenarios in this, and if you could you know, expand a bit about these scenarios, uh, that would yeah. be quite nice. So I, I, I would say, maybe just to clarify, um, the Paris Agreement does mention two degrees and one point five degrees, but I think as as the as the person actually rightly pointed out, the the anchor was actually two degrees itself. Um, uh, one point five was mentioned in passing, but because of not much studies, there, there wasn't too much emphasis being placed on that uh, the, the the Glasgow um, uh, decision actually sought that round. The goalpost has been changed to a one point five degree type goalpost. And I'd say over the years, if you look at some of the global um, uh, assessment in terms of where we are at, actually, um, I, I recall seeing numbers five, six years ago, which says actually the world was on a 3.2, 3.4 degree sort of pathway. If you added up all the pledges which countries said they would do and assume that they would do it, it will get you to about, I think, 3.3, 3.4 degrees. The latest numbers that I saw after Glasgow, I think the figure was 1.8 degrees to about 2.2 or 2.3 degrees. Uh. And the range is that 1.8 assumes everything all the way up to their long-term plans. The 2.2, 2.3 actually assumes only their nearer term plans up to their uh, NDC, which is 2030 itself. Uh, so you, you can see, um, if, you, if you assume that, um, if you look at whatever countries say they will do, um, there has clearly been a shift. Uh, there's clearly been an improvement in terms of the outcomes itself. Uh, but I, I think which has been rightly pointed out, we are not at 1.5 degrees yet. There is still a gap. Um, if you look at potential studies around the world, there is, we, 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 we are, there is clearly the potential to reach 1.5 degrees. I, I think the main issue is, is, is a couple of issues. Now, one, I think we need um, a system to ensure that when countries say that they would uh, meet their pledge and, and, and then they put out a certain pledge, they are serious about meeting that pledge itself. 
Uh, I mean, Singapore is, I think, one of the um, uh, few countries around the world that, that takes whatever we say very seriously. Uh, and in the past, we have been criticized for being a bit too conservative because of that. Uh, but, but the reason is that what, what, whatever we say, we will do, we, we will actually do it. And, and you can count on us to uh, uh, actually achieve the outcome. So I, I, I think we need that to be more widespread. Um, the, the other thing that, that we need is, uh, because there's still a gap, uh, countries to be able to update their ambition over time. Uh, some countries that have um, uh, came on board with um, uh, less ambitious outcomes, maybe to, 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 to look at what can be done. And, and, and to see whether, whether, you, uh, whether, whether there's scope to increase ambition. I think collectively over time, as the economics improve, as the technology improves, um, I, I would be a bit hopeful uh, that, that we can keep the 1.5 degrees within reach itself. Uh, but I, I must emphasize this point that even if we can get to 1.5 degrees, it doesn't mean that there's no climate impact. Right now, we are already at 1.1 degrees Celsius. And you look at the kind of climate impacts we are seeing with 1.1 degrees Celsius. Even in the best case scenario where we can hit 1.5 degrees, it's an increase from the current levels, which means that adaptation uh, actually needs to take place. The, the issue is to what extent we need to adapt. I mean, if you miss the, the more you miss 1.5 degrees, the, um, the, the, the more adaptation is actually required. And there are a number of studies out there that actually shows that um, um, uh, trying to reduce emissions is actually more cost effective than trying to adapt to the impact of climate change itself. Yeah, thanks. Exactly. Thank you so much, Benedict. Clearly, we don't. We shouldn't be panicking. Um, mm. Keep calm and and carry on. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so the next question, I think there are some overlapping questions because the next one mm. that is from Abhishek is somewhat similar about um you know measuring the evidence, uh, what evidence do we have that says that our efforts have borne fruit and the climate is healing. Um, so clearly the idea here is that it's somewhere along the lines of how it was like for um, ozone uh, related issue. But uh, like you mentioned, Benedict, we already are moving 1.1 uh, degree higher. So that's uh, unfortunately, we're not healing, we're really adapting and mitigating as much risk as we can. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, can we look at the private sector? Um, private sector, when private sector does cost benefit analysis of green investment in, let's say, architecture, how does it calculate the benefits of its decision on the climate and environment beyond carbon footprint? Is this something you can answer to, Esther? Yeah, certainly. Actually, I have seen quite a few questions also. It's like, how, you know, uh, well, in Singapore, it's so hot. How can we, you know, how can uh, people ad ad adapt to the hot weather uh, come, uh, or sacrifice, you know? And uh, as a, a developer, cooling is one of our top, top priority. Uh, the reason is we are just next to the equator, you know, it's hot every day. Yeah, and uh, in fact, recently you can even feel even hotter sometimes, you know, uh, even hotter than before. And uh, well, according to data, Singapore is sitting up twice as fast as other parts of the world, you know. So I think um, as a developer, we see it as from day one when we acquire a plot of land, how do we design it? How do we make use of the ventilation, natural uh, uh, ventilation and light and all that to minimize, you know, tapping on re, uh, uh, air condition and all that is very important. And uh, actually, a lot of experts already say that technologies are available. But like what Ben said, is about implementation. And of course, business, you also have to look at the business case of how can you invest and yet you can still maintain financially viable because business need to survive. If not, you know, the, the people who suffer is your employees. If you are not maintaining financial viability, you need to retrench people. The first group of people to suffer is your, your employers, uh, your employees and your family. So we see it as environmental, social, financial sustainability are as important. Right. So I think what we need to do is really tap onto technology. And just now, Ben also talked about funding. Who is going to fund it? Right. We can't just pass down the, the you know, the investment to our consumers. So I think what we have done is we launched the first green bond as far back as in 2017. And uh, well, in recent year, I would really say that a lot of banks are actually already stepping up on, you know, um, sustainable finance, green loan, sustainability link loan, and all that. Really put money 
you know, to, um, uh, to accelerate climate action and green building and green infrastructure. We have seen that, you can see the data, even globally, you can see that, you know, um, green finance um, uh, volume has exceeded $1 trillion this year. So in Singapore also, we have seen a lot more banks, you know, um, are very into, you know, uh, promoting and uh, providing uh, green loans and uh, green bond and, and all that as well. So, but now is also we need to educate, like for example, uh, maintaining buildings is something that you know, high, you know, high impact as well. And uh, we also have digital platform and uh, to, you know, yeah, I think you, you, you have probably have experienced the same thing when you walk into some big hotel, the conference room are not even using, but why is a light are all on, air cons are all on. So what we have actually look at it is uh, all the, uh, you know, building owners are also looking at how can we use digital platform using sensors to identify area that when there's no usage you don't need to provide the lighting or the air condition you need something very implementable you know solutions digitalize you know such uh, uh, resource uh, providing um, uh, gadget so I think there are definitely you know ways to reduce and um, uh, consumption and improve efficiency is very important you can't switch off every light you know and you can't you know just, just tell our tenants that we are not going to provide uh, air condition for three hours you know so it's we need to look at productivity comfort of users and also look at how technology can help to improve efficiency and how can we design to reduce you know uh, to to optimize it so that we don't need to rely totally on you know, air condition. So there are a lot of, you know, issues that we are looking at and uh, not just today, we already started and just now I talk about, we are at NUS here, looking, talking to many scientists and designer, architect, engineer to look at what can we do with more renewable energy? You know, what sort of solar panels are we talking about? Not just the flat panels, but looking at building integrated, you know, facade band panels. And we are looking at a lot of, uh, you know, um, solutions and technology. And we're even tapping onto like innovators, young startup and all. So we are doing a lot of, you know, uh, the businesses are looking at very, very many solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question, uh, I think maybe perhaps give the space for Lastrina as well to talk about um, advocacy. Um, one of the question from Crystal Ng, uh, one of the themes raised during the recent GCNS, Global Compact um, Network Singapore Youth Forum, was how we could be inclusive in the sustainability movement. How do we include the older generation as well? Would love panelists' input on such intergenerational sustainability movement. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Lastrina, you want to chime in? I know you're not just representing uh, youth now, you get, you're representing us in the uh, advocacy space, please. Um, yeah, thanks, Crystal, for the question. Um, I think for me, hmm, perhaps um, the way I respond to this would be in two different parts, right? So first is how do we include the older generation, the current older generation, rather? So I think if I think about the current uh, older generation, um, maybe I would like to rephrase it back to you, like, why do you think we need to include the older generation and not the older generation, including us, the younger generation, in their activities, in their contexts? Um, so I'm just thinking that, you know, it works both ways. Um, and for me, when I think about it like that, then the question for me is how do we get people talking to each other? Um, and how do we get together? How do we create a common space with each other? Talk. Uh, with each other and work towards a common cause. Uh, so when I think of it from that perspective, um, and then in terms of the advocacy side of things, then, you know, one good example that I can think of is what Farah was previously involved with, uh, which is Repair Kopitiam. So Repair Koti Kopitiam, I think when it first started off, yes, um, uh, the, the idea, I think Farah can share even better, but, you know, the idea of going into neighborhoods, engaging with the residents uh, to repair their appliances, and over time, in terms of the model of engagement, I think for Repair Kopitiam also, they actively involved the older generation to be um, the... What do you call them, Farah? The repair masters? Uh, coaches, coaches. Coaches. Repair coaches. Um, so I think, you know, that's a very current example of how advocacy groups or green groups can engage the older generation uh, in the sustainability movement, right? So that's my, I guess, one part of my response to you, Crystal. Um, the other part of my response here, I'm just going back to, you know, the idea of futures thinking and 
maybe perhaps what we've been talking about so far is scenario planning and um, just responding to the current context. I'm, I'm also trying to look at futures uh, in terms of a longer time frame, right? So 2030, 2050, beyond. Uh, in Singapore's context, currently we have one out of four uh, aging uh, is an elderly in terms of aging population. 2030 onwards, we're looking at one out of three, if I'm not wrong, so it's one out of four to one out of three. Uh, in terms of aging population. Um, and then in terms of the things associated with aging population is healthcare. Uh, so this one is something that I learned because of uh, my work. So I got to know of this organization called Healthcare Without Harm uh, and the work that they do. Uh, in one of the reports they released last year, they mentioned that healthcare in Singapore is one of the top carbon emitters in the world. Uh, if you wanna, you know, and it's comparable alongside countries like Australia, Canada, and the US. So if I'm looking at a context where I know, so it's a, it's, it's a certain fact, right? That we will have an aging population in Singapore and then there's going to be a growing need uh, in the healthcare sector. Then in terms of my thinking right now, going back to what Esther mentioned about the built environment, the cooling systems, how then can Singapore cater to uh, the growing needs of the healthcare se sector while at the same time minimizing their carbon emissions? So then I think that sort of, framing and thinking gives way to um, another set of question in terms of how we can engage the, the future older generation now uh, to think about what we can do to cater to our lifestyle needs in the next 20, 30 years. So yeah, Crystal, that's a the great question, right? Because now I'm thinking of different sets of um, alternative uh, futures that might happen uh, in Singapore. Well, in this case, it's a certain future, right? But also this gives way to other alternative futures that might happen in Singapore. So um, given the current context, like very recently, just two, three days ago, uh, with Malaysia cutting their um, supply of chicken into Singapore, that effectively cuts one third of a uh, chicken uh, poultry supply, right, into Singapore. So I think um, when, I, when I look at the certain pathway for Singapore, like, you know, it's great uh, that the government two, three years back already launched the 30 by 30 plan. And we're working towards that. And we're now inviting companies um, to be based off Singapore or like, you know, we're pumping so much money into companies such as Shok Meats, for example, uh, to, to explore, I think, vegan seafood. Um, so there's so many things going on right now in terms of growing the food industry and in terms of meeting the needs uh, 30 by 30, right, by 2030. But I'm also thinking, okay, that alternative future that Singapore might be a vegetarian society 2030 and beyond is also one that I would like to imagine that is a, an alternative future, you know, with what Malaysia um, has uh, sort of, the consequences of what Malaysia has done for Singapore, it's very real. Um, and other uh, similar instances like that might happen in the near future. So then there's the alternative future of, okay, you know, maybe Singapore might be a vegetarian society 2030 and beyond, um, or vegan society for that matter. Um, so what can I do now to explore those alternatives uh, and those reimagined pathways, right? So there's so many things I think we can talk about uh, in this sustainability space um, that I think we just need to be a bit more creative um, in terms of maybe what we imagine. And there needs to be that um, collective reimagination and rethinking about what Singapore can be 2030 and beyond. Yeah, if I can expand on it, uh, Lestrina, is very real, you know, and uh, I think health is actually on the top priority of everyone now. And uh, during COVID, actually, you know, I, I think the data show that people spend more time outdoor because we are locked down, we can't go to shopping mall or restaurant and all that. Actually, a lot of people go to parks and park connectors and uh, sometimes you find it more crowded than, than, than more. So I think people are very concerned. Of health and even for the building environment, we look at IAQ indoor air quality more important than ever because in the past we already looking at it, but now tenants actually even ask like, oh, what is your filtering system? You know, is yeah. your indoor quality very good? You know, talk like you know, really an expert. So we understand, and then these are all the changing mindset, and we are also consumer. We are not just you know a builder. So I think these are 
all on top of our priority. And in fact, for newer development, we devoted like uh, more than a lot more than mandatory requirement of uh, forty percent into greenery. And uh, like um, the one that uh, in in our East Coast Amber Park is sixty five percent of you know the site area for uh, landscaping facilities, you know, running track and all that. So people are actually definitely you know welcome. You know, you, this is also an opportunity for product to be adjusted, moderated to meet the, you know, um, and, uh, you know, the growing trend, the future needs. And you're very right. We actually are also promoting like, you know, community farming and uh, residents, we are saying, you know, herbal farming and all that. And in fact, we are also piloting, I think you saw the, the two set of uh, indoor um, uh, hydroponic sets uh, in our academy. Every two, three weeks, they actually harvest a lot of lovely vegetables, okay? And um, we are actually trying to promote, you know, um, welcome, you know, just to, to give a heads up that in a World Environment Day coming up, we are actually, you know, showcasing like Edible Garden, uh, a, a gentleman called Midnight Gardening, Gardener, actually, she really grow a lot of vegetable greenery along the corridor of her, her, his uh, HDB flat. So we are showcasing that we hope that to support the 30 by 30 goal, we want to promote the idea of farming everyone, everywhere, whether at home, you know, at work or at school, or even, you know, f and outlet, you know, from farm to table, we actually, you know, grow your own herbs and uh, put on the table. So I think there are a lot of things, creativities, you know, there's no boundary. And uh, looking at Crystal's question, actually, I was a speaker on the panel for inclusivity. And I always say that when you talk about saving the world, sustainability, it should go beyond the borders or boundaries of country, gender, age group, and cultures everybody has equal opportunity and uh, responsibility to drive the green agenda, whether older or younger generation, we should all work together. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Esther. I just want to chime in on that part because I, um, Repair Kopitiam was mentioned. Um, clearly, there's, um, I mean, to us, when we started Repair Kopitiam, there was also this uh, appeal to the different motivations of people uh, when it comes to sustainability. Not everybody is going to jump into it thinking that they are going to save the world. They just want to do something that is interesting and good for them. So uh, for Repair Kopitiam, uh, which is a movement on repair, these elderly who joined in wanted to basically um, you know, learn repair, um, you know, use their hands, you know, as they retire already. So they're a bit, um, they wanted to try something new. So I think looking at inclusivity in, the, in that way, where we motivate people in different aspects of their lives, um, instead of just telling them that, about it being green and, you know, getting them to understand sustainability, I think that's a, a way to look at it. Yeah, so that is, um, on that question, thank you for that question, Crystal. Uh, we actually have time for one more question, and I know that Benedict has already chopped some questions. He has uh, pre-selected some questions to answer. Benedict, would you like to choose one of them uh, before we end of this session? Um, oh, okay, I, I, I can maybe say something very brief. I was, I was hoping to answer all the questions. Uh, hey, I, also, in, in I very, also would love you to answer all the in, questions. In, in very, very short, yeah. So um, uh, there was a question on hype and, and, and things being fluffy. And I, I would say that one of the things that we are seeing is that both in the voluntary space uh, as well as in the uh, more mandatory space itself, um, uh, corporate disclosure requirements, uh, things like science-based target initiative, things like the task force for uh, climate-related financial disclosures, uh, these actually require companies, uh, corporates out there, when we put up a certain target to actually back it up by concrete measures itself. And I, I, I think such initiatives are important because I do agree you need to go beyond the hype, you need to go beyond the fluff. If not, it, it will be seen as, 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 as greenwashing and, 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 and that would hurt us more than help us itself. Um, there was another question in terms of um, um, holding corporates responsible for contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I know Esther probably alluded to it earlier, but I just wanted to make the, the pitch to say that as part of our announcements this year on increased climate ambition, we also talked about increasing the carbon tax rate in Singapore. Uh, previously, it's, it's currently at $5, and previously we said we will go up to 10 to 15 um, but the revised rate is, is to push it up to $25, $45, and then by the end of this decade, $50 to $80. And, and we see the carbon tax as important as a price signal um, um, to um, uh, get companies to internalize some of the externalities that they are causing as a result of uh, greenhouse gas emissions itself. 
Uh, the last question, which I just wanted to answer very, very briefly, is how is Singapore contributing to knowledge sharing? And I'd say one of our key programs is our Singapore Cooperation Program, where we bring um, uh, uh, key um, uh, government officials from other countries around the region to Singapore to train. And so far, we have been involved in training more than 100,000 uh, officials uh, on, on climate and sustainability areas itself. Uh, but I, I, I'd say we, we, we think um, um, uh, we, we don't want to be seen as, as like uh, being above them and, and, and being a leader per se. Like, because I, I, I think what we have realized is that going forward, actually, it's important to see them as partners. How can we collaborate together to implement some of the solutions that can help uh, the, the region as a whole and individual countries actually meet some of their uh, emissions and climate and sustainability goals itself? Yeah, thanks. Wow, that was amazing. You answered all three questions within... Two minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Benedict. Okay, so um, concluding thoughts. I think the last thing that you want to say to everybody to, um, you know, maybe um, one, if there's one takeaway, you know, what you feel about sustainability and how the future could be better. Um, if you could share with us um, just a one-liner before we end off the session, that would be great. So maybe we'll start with Lastrina. The last speaker to the first speaker again. I think for me would be always read the news. <laughs> yeah, I, I will not elaborate, but yeah, always read the, read news. the news. Yeah, yes, yes, I'm quite sure. Uh, yeah, having a pulse on it, important. All right, thank you. Um, how about you, Esther? Well, I think I would just end with uh, ABC, right? Turning ex uh, ambition to action, okay? And the business case, it will become stronger. So the cost of action will be uh, cheaper than the cost of inaction, you know, and moving forward. And last but not least is collaboration because one people cannot do everything, and, but with, everyone can do something, yeah, to amplify action and impact. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And last but not least, Benedict. Um, well, maybe just something very simple. Uh, let's work together to keep the hopes of 1.5 degrees alive so that we can leave the world a better place for our children uh, and for the next generation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I mean, if this was a big room, I would have asked everybody to give a round of applause, but thank you. You can give reactions on the chat maybe, uh, but thank you so much to our panelists. I would now like to hand over the time to our host, Cheryl. Thank you so much, everybody. See you again. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to Farah, uh, Benedict, uh, Esther and Lestrina, it was such a wonderful conversation uh, and I think you all brought your different perspectives uh, to this uh, discussion. I think for me, my big takeaway is, um, is you know, when we're looking at the future of, of something as big and complex as sustainability, you know, it's really about working together and I really love what Lestrina said about harnessing collective imagination, right, which is so much part, core to what we do in Futures Work, uh, you know, to, to also kind of establish, I would say, uh, different ideas, right? Different possibilities of what this, this future could look like, you know, and, and, you know, I love the action oriented and the action bias that, you know, even as we dream up these alternative futures, you know, we still have a responsibility and a duty of care to uh, take action today, you know? Uh, so thank you so much for, for your generous sharing, uh, our three panelists, and of course the wonderful moderation, uh, Farah. Um, so it leaves me just to kind of slowly, gently wrap up the session, uh, you know, and uh, share a little bit, um, uh, some some so admin or housekeeping uh, matters before our uh, as we wrap up before we, we end off our session. Can I get uh, the slides up if that's okay? Okay, so the first thing is really uh, thank you very much for joining us. We always have such a great diversity of audience uh, in these sessions and we benefit a lot from your feedback. We do read the feedback quite seriously. Uh, so please let us know if you haven't already uh, by scanning the QR code and just letting us know what, uh, you know, what your thoughts are, uh, any key uh, you know, kind of uh, feedback that you would like us to, to, to know. And, and I think the other part is also any ideas for future webinars, you know, where we commit to doing these uh, regularly. And it's our contribution, you know, in a small way from an academic institution to the knowledge sharing. Uh, so if you've got any ideas of future topics that you would like us to cover, uh, please share that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oops. Wonderful. Yep. So we, uh, 
uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, uh, we're from the Executive Education Department. So we do run many uh, executive programs, uh, of course, in future. So the next one that is coming up is the Future of Public Policy Run. This is uh, our in-person program. We're delighted to be back to face-to-face -face, uh, in the classroom. So uh, if you apply now, there is a 20% early bird. Um, you know, we do run other public policy open enrollment programs as well. So communications, uh, essentials of policy development, which is our kind of like intro to policy, uh, and of course, more in uh, impact evaluation analysis. So those are some of the upcoming uh, programs that we're running. Uh, again, if you would like more info, please get in touch with the team. Then you can also scan the QR code for more info on these programs. Next slide. Uh, you know, we were really delighted for this particular um, uh, webinar to partner with our colleagues, uh, you know, at uh, NUS as well, you know, kind of looking at what we do kind of more uh, broadly, you know, uh, in terms of what we do in, the, in uh, sustainability and climate change as a university and not just our great small <laughs> graduate public policy school, but a much wider university. So, you know, if you are interested to, to uh, find out more about how we think about sustainability uh, and these issues, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, and I mean, not just uh, also leveraging on our expertise, research and so on, you know, please take a look, uh, you know, again, scanning the QR code, uh, as well as that link here for more info, uh, you know, and, and just get to get a little bit of a sense of what the NUS overall view is. I'd be very interested also uh, to engage you uh, in, in our other areas of expertise beyond just the public policy space. Next slide. Uh, and then the last one, please keep in touch, you know, so if you're uh, interested in futures, interest, interested in executive education or would like to connect with us on LinkedIn, we are very welcome uh, to, to get in touch with us at the emails and the QR codes uh, uh, listed here. I think that's the last slide. Uh, so that leaves me to uh, wrap up uh, today's session. Um, and just to say that, okay, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Really delighted to, to host uh, all of you again. Uh, thank you again to our wonderful uh, panel. So uh, Benedict, Esther, as well as Estrina, and of course to our, our moderator, uh, Farah. I really hope the conversation continues either in person or in the online space. And I uh, do encourage you to continue to mull about the future of sustainability uh, as you enjoy the rest of your day and evening. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for joining us.